The more time that goes on, the less I have to say, and the more time I spend listening. I used to have so much to say. I don't anymore. The work is my evidence of the knowledge I carry. I am a reflection of all those that surround me, and I'm still finding my way. Hello? Hello, I'm looking for Don McGarth. Yep, that's me. I'm calling to let you know that your aunt is in the hospital. We have her on an IV drip. Ma, I need a form signed for a field trip today. It needs to be in by the end of the day. Just let me know when it's here. Caribou Fire Center, Caribou Fire Center, this is MC2. MC2, this is dispatch, go ahead. I don't know that I really choose the engineering aspect of it so much. It's something I grew up not believing I would be able to accomplish just because of the challenges and the stereotype around um, women in, in, in a male-dominated industry. I started doing this over 20, 30 years ago. So there was a very different climate and atmosphere for acceptance about my presence in the workforce and having to work through those and understanding the different dynamics that um, you kind of have to have a, a definite passion and heart for this industry just so that you have the ability to weather those storms and come through those challenges uh, looking at those burdens as gifts as opposed to something that was taken away or um, something that you couldn't work through. Talking with my grandpa, he was a, a great character. He could have a good sense of humor. He liked to be out hunting and fishing. He liked to be out in the bush. He liked the quiet and solitude. He didn't like a whole lot of busyness. If it got busy, he kind of disappeared. I remember coming home and I was about 12, 14 maybe. And I was at that place in life where I was trying to find my own identity and self-acceptance because you grow up with a lot of shame when you're surrounded by racism and when you're surrounded with discrimination even when it's from your own people it's very hard and so I got off the bus and I told them I said you know and I was crying because I was really upset I said just doesn't seem to matter what I do I'm not good enough The kids down here call me an apple. They tell me I'm a half-breed. They call me white. I go to town, I get called a squaw. I get called an Indian. I get called all these other names. I said, but none of that, like, I just didn't understand how I could be rejected by everyone. What did I do? So here I am going to a person that I truly trusted and looked to for guidance. He kind of shifted his hat and nodded, walked into the kitchen, made some tea, and then walked right by me to his room. And I thought, just one more person that didn't hear me. The next day I got off the bus and I'm sitting there doing my homework on the couch. And he walked up and he stood right at this chair, right at the base of the couch. So I had to look up to him. And he said, you know, don't ever forget the foundation that we built in you. The world you're going to, you're gonna get walked on by both sides. But we made sure you were strong. I think, thinking about driving down here and what, what I was, wanting out of this week was the biggest expense I've had to pay and the biggest toll was understanding I was never intended to be here. You take a look at every statistic out there. Indigenous, that's a strike. Woman, that's a strike. Biracial home, that's a strike. Single mom, that's a strike. Somehow, 
with all of those odds stacked against me, I'm still making it through. Absolutely bar none. Uh, she set the, the bar so high and I think it just takes a different level of commitment. I feel like uh, what's necessary to follow in those footsteps is, is a mystery to me because it, it really hasn't been done. She's my only example, especially in my own community. And I feel like it's just absolutely like the, the example she set for me is, is good, but like I really don't know all the struggles she's gone through and it's kind of something that is personal to her. We talked about, you know, maybe our relationship wasn't perfect at times and that there was a lot of sacrifice and I understood that from a very young age. I, I knew that she, she was doing something very important and, and involved maybe at some times her not being home or sometimes her, her doing something different or her being somewhere, right? And, and I never took it personally. I, I always knew that it was for a better cause, a better cause for not only me, but for my people. And, and I absolutely, I understood it, but at a certain point, I, I stepped back and I was like, but I'm still her son. And, and a lot of the time that affected me, it would have been a lot easier if I had, you know, somebody else in the household, like a father or, or like a father figure growing up. And, and most of the time it really just left me feeling quite alone. And, and I didn't want to feel that way. I felt it was selfish. I felt that it was very, you know, self-centered. But at times, like, I was a kid and, and I needed somebody at the house. But what she was doing, like, she knew the sacrifices that needed to be made. And she, whatever she did, it worked out because I'm, I'm not a, a failure. You know, like I'm not, I'm not doing drugs or anything. So it's whatever she did, I knew it was for the better. And I had faith in her the whole time that she knew what she was doing and she was doing the right stuff. And ultimately that's what made us get into this situation, right?